I don't really want to use this mic, but I guess I should. So um, there's a URL there. If you have a laptop and a REPL, go there. There's um, a couple steps of instructions. As long as you already have Maven, you'll be able to um, bring this right up, the latest version that was checked in you know, this morning, and um, try it out. You should be able to, the code snippets on the slides, you should be able to just try. So um, I'd love it if you guys do that, and uh, that way you can find my bugs before the end of the talk. Okay, um, right, so I'll be talking about um, an implementation of finger trees um, for closure. Finger trees were invented by Ralph Heinze, I believe is how his name is pronounced, and Ross Patterson. Hang on a second here, I'm going to start a timer. Which I should have done. Okay. Um, not by me. <laughs> I, uh, all I did was um, a best attempt at um, converting their uh, very detailed um, paper with all of its Haskell examples into, you know, a language with readable syntax. Uh, so, okay. Um, so, finger trees are another persistent collection type. I, I think for this audience, we know what we mean by persistent here. Uh, it's not about disks, it's about um, being immutable and um, have all the versions of a particular structure all performing the way you would expect, not degrading the performance as you go along. Finger trees complement Clojure's existing collections, which is a diplomatic way of saying that um, there are reasonable things that a Clojure program might want to do that uh, cannot be done well with Clojure's existing persistent data structures. And finger trees can help fill in some of those gaps. Of course, the flip side of that is that uh, when you can use uh, closures, existing collection types, uh, they're generally preferable to finger trees. Um, and finger trees are customizable. Um, one way to think about this is that the sorted set and map collections are a little bit customizable because you can provide a comparator. Um, finger trees take that to a whole new level, and we'll see how that works. In fact, they're so customizable, I'm not even going to start talking about the general finger tree. We're going to talk about a specific implementation that comes with the library called a double list. You create a double list using the same syntax you would to create a regular closure list, right? You pass in some elements that you want to be in there. Um, we're going to store it in the DL bar. And uh, that prints as a seek, right? Four, five, six, seven. Uh, because it is a seek. It actually is a seek. Like uh, persistent list, it itself implements seek. <clears throat> and like a list, you can call first and rest on it to examine things from the left hand side. But you can also call peek and pop on it to uh, access things from the right hand side. So that's a, why I call it a double list. It's double-headed. You can get to either end. All right. One thing of note here is that um, unlike a vector, a vector you can also uh, peek and pop on one side, and you can call first and rest on the other. But here, rest and pop are symmetric. On a vector, if you call rest, you'll get a sequence, right? Not a vector. Here, both of those are real double lists. The type is maintained as you as you uh, pull things off of either end. Okay, so that's how you access the left and the right side. Um, but we'd also like to add things to the left and the right side. Uh, the problem there, um, a little hiccup, is that the function we would want to use for that are perhaps uh, conj and cons. Um, but <coughs> conj has the unique feature of adding to one side or the other depending on the actual collection underneath. So you can't assume that it's always going to add on one side. Um, and uh, cons, as it is in uh, Clojure right now, doesn't allow you to extend it in a way that would allow us to keep the type. So at least for now, the library provides a couple of new conj functions, which I called conj r and cons l. I'm trying to give as many hints as possible as to which side you're going to add things to. So conj r is like conj, same parameters, but I promise I'll always add things to the right when you call it. Um, cons l always adds to the left, 
but it keeps the collection type. Uh, you can see there also the argument ordering is consistent with cons rather than cons um, for what it's worth. So that's how you can add to either the left or the right sides of a double list. Okay, yeah, and so far, all the operations we've looked at here are called amortized constant time. That is, you can peak, pop, first rest, add on either end. All of those are essentially constant time operations. The word amortized there means something very specific that I would not be able to explain, but it has to do with um, sometimes the operation is slower and sometimes it's faster depending upon the shape of the tree you're dealing with. And, uh, but, uh, in the paper, for anyone who can understand it, it apparently proves that um, any of the slower operations are paid for by doing faster operations interleaved in such a way that it comes out being constant time in general. So, what kind of data structure, what would be the shape of a data structure that can actually let you do constant time operations on both ends? I mean, if you think about a regular binary tree, the ends are, are way down, right? You have to descend several times through a binary tree to get to either end. So what does a finger tree look like? <laughs> Sorry, I know, it's a little obvious. Okay, this is what a finger tree looks like. Um, so there's several things to note here. Um, this is what happens when you build a double list of a bunch of symbols. Um, right, so the first thing to note is what I was just talking about. The uh, left and rightmost items are always one step down here, okay? So you can always get to the rightmost and leftmost items in a single step, constant time, they're always right there. Um, another thing to note is that every one of these nodes, both the leaves and the intermediate nodes, um, in this example, they're all three or smaller, the code promises that they will never be more than four items in any given node. That's important when we start talking about complexity, we know it's a fixed size. They are smaller when, they, when you don't have uh, the need to store more things in them. Um, the depth of these left and right nodes is interesting because, like I said, for the top level, they're one level down. But this middle node is special. When you go down the level there, you have a subtree, where now the left and right items are pointing to trees that are one level deeper. So in this case, two steps, right? One, two to get to your leaf nodes. Same thing over here, one, two. This here is a symbol I'm using for an empty list, but if we had to put more items in there, this would get to be another level of tree, and the leaves off of that would be three steps away. So as the tree gets deeper, the, the leaves off to the side get deeper uh, as well. The reason that's important is because um, we can see that adding, if we were to add another item on the right here, we can see that we would be able to do that easily in constant time because we would have a new element here holding four things and we just need a new, row, new, a new root to point to that new collection on the side, right? So that would be fast. The problem is if we added another item now we would have to have five and that's not allowed. So what we would have to do is split this node and push a couple of these elements like O and P down the tree a bit into some empty spot in the next level. Um, most of the time there would be room there because this is a deeper tree, there's more room in it. If that tree is also full, then you would have to push down even further in a sort of a logarithmic process. The, it, less and less frequently you have to push deeper and deeper into the tree. That combined with um, some clever use of delay to sort of build a closure over the um, subtrees is how you can um, get your amortized constant time. The fast operations of adding things on that top level of the tree uh, helps you pay for the more costly operations of pushing things down as you go along. Okay, so having done this, we have many of the features of a persistent list, right? You can walk through it, you can get to either end, uh, but one thing persistent li list has that this does not is you can ask a persistent list for its size and get the answer back right away, right? With this, if this is all the data we have, the only way to get the size of the tree would be to walk all the way along the edge, walk the entire tree. That would be a linear operation, right? So not fast at all. So one thing we could do 
fix that would be to add a little bit of information on each node. Here, we are going to, as we're building the tree, measure each of the nodes and put the result of that measurement sort of on the node itself. So how many, what's the count of one node? One, there's one A, so we have a single item there. Okay. Um, down here we have three, and so the measure of that, the count of that is three. Same thing for all these. And then as we work our way up the tree, as these nodes are combined and, and the tree is built, we sum them so that we know this entire branch down here contains a total of nine items. The nine and the three here get added to 12, right? All those get added to know that we have 16. So now when we want to know the size, if we used a counted double list, we can simply ask the root node for its size. It knows how big the list is, and it can give you the answer right away, which is handy. And so now we do have the features of a persistent list. Um, but persistent list and vector both provide count without decorating interior nodes like that. We did a lot of work here to, to put these counts throughout the tree rather than just counting up or down at the root node as we go along. So why would we do that? Well, this is why. Because we want to do nth on it. OK, now hang with me. This is the hardest slide <coughs> for me to explain anyway. Um, can you even see those numbers? Plus one and plus three, that's okay. They didn't help that much anyway. Okay, so, um, all right. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find the fifth item in the tree. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to have an accumulator keeping track of how many things are on the left of our navigation. As we go down, we're gonna keep a running total of how much is on the left side of our path, okay? So, and, and the, the question at each point of, of the walk of the tree is which node do we wanna descend into? So we're gonna start at the root node here and try to decide which of these three nodes to descend into. Well, we can look at the count of the one on the left and see that at most, we're only gonna find one item down there. We're looking for item number five. One is never gonna be enough. So we do not descend to the left. If we go to the middle, we can add one and 12 together to get 13. And we know that we will get 13 items. At, at most, 13 items if we descend down in. And so we've crossed from below five to more than five. So we know the node we're looking for is in between there. So we descend and do it again. We uh, now have a running total of one. We're only gonna take the one that we know we uh, are gonna keep on the left, put that in our accumulator, plus one, and scan the nodes under that. Three is here, so we're gonna add one and three. We get four. That's still not enough. If we were to go down that branch, the most we could possibly find are four items. We're looking for the fifth one. It's not good enough. So we add the one and the three and the zero. Still not enough. One, three, and nine gives us plenty, right? What is that? Uh, 13. 13 is more than five, and so we know the item we're looking for is in there, so we descend. Now we're here. Do it again. We're gonna look on the left, try to add three to our one and three here. So four uh, plus three is, what are we at now? <laughs> okay. Um, that's plenty, right? We know that's enough, that's more than five. <laughs> <laughs> and so we descend, and now we're doing one at a time until we find um, the one plus the three plus this first one is four. That's not more than five. Did I say that right? I did that wrong. Four, five. Five is not more than five, so we do the next one. Six is more than five. That's the item we want. Uh, you'd think. Believe me, I did this wrong lots of times first. <laughs> Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Fifth item, okay? So, I was gonna say something else about that. Oh, right, this is a uh, login operation, right? We went down the tree, we had a fixed number of maximum possible steps at each node, maximum four, as we walked down, um, and we only went through the path once, so that's log in, look up by index. So now we have a thing that is even more like a vector, right? We can not only add to the left side, which you can't do with a vector, you can add to the right, and you can find its count, and you can look things up by index. So we're doing great. Um, if you need a little bit more detail on how exactly these numbers are added up, I uh, included a slide. Oh, never mind. that comes later. Okay, sorry. Um, right, so, um, 
One thing you can do with a vector that we haven't shown yet is you can replace an item inside the vector. Right? You can do a, a sock, is that how we say it? To replace an, an item in the middle. Well, it so happens that finger trees implement a couple of operations that help us to do that. And the really magical one is called split. Split allows you to follow that same path through the tree, but as you go, it tears it apart. Picks it apart into two separate trees along the path that you follow, leaving a correct finger tree on the left of everything before the split, a correct finger tree on the right of everything after the split, and the one item in the middle that you found walking through the tree. That, combined with another operation called concat, which stitches them back together, gives you everything you need to implement a sock. And that could look like this. So here, I'm gonna do a split of our counted double list at five, right? So now we have our left part and our right part, which you can see here. And then I'm gonna do a couple operations. First, I'm going to take a new item. All right, so note here, uh, a, B, a, a through E, so we're missing the F, right, that we found, and then we have G through F. So now in place of the F, I'm going to put this um, XX symbol on the right-hand side of the left-hand tree sort of there in the middle. And then I'm gonna concat that whole new tree from the left and the whole tree from the right to rebuild my entire tree up from the ground. And now I have the same sequence I had before with the F replaced with XX. Split and concat are both log in operations. We already said the conj is constant time. So two times log n plus a constant is still log n time. So this is a log n replacement of an item in the middle. So we caught up with vector. We can do the things that vector can do, and we can still add on the left. Um, but we can do more than that, because now that you know we can do a split and a concat, there's nothing uh, requiring you to put exactly one item where there used to be exactly one item. You can do removes and inserts. So this top one here, we don't bother adding anything in the middle at all. And in the bottom one, we insert uh, several items using into, right, to put several things on the end of the left tree stitch the right tree back up onto it. And now we've got a longer vector that's longer in the middle, sorry, a, uh, <laughs> a longer finger tree that's longer in the middle. And nth still works. The indexes that you would use to get to these right-hand items is now larger than it used to be, right? Because they're shifted over. But if you think about how we walk through the tree, coming up with the sum as we go, you can see that that can still be doing structural sharing with the old version of the tree and yet have new indexes to get. Right, let's see what I'm supposed to have been saying that I have. Oh, good. Okay. So, how do we tell a finger tree that we want to um, add a count to each of the in interior nodes? We do it by providing a meter object, what I call a meter object, um, when we create a finger tree. So this code right here is uh, essentially what is inside the constructor function for count a double list. A generic finger tree with a specific meter. A meter is made of three parts. We have a measure, which is a function that takes one element from our collection and returns some value, what, what we're measuring. In this case, we want to know the count the count of a single item is always one. So the function I'm using is constantly one. The second thing the meter needs is what is the measure of an empty? If you have an empty tree, how many things are in it? Zero, this is not a function, this is always just a constant. And finally, you need some kind of function to combine counts. So the, the plus there means if you have a tree of five things and a tree of two things, and you can cap them, what is the measure of them together? It's the sum of the two counts, right? So we're at it. Um, you don't really need to know that the measure of empty and combine together form a thing called a monoid, but I thought I'd tell you anyway. If you like the word monoid and want to learn more about it, <laughs> you can explain to me later what this means. This is straight from the, <laughs> this is straight from the paper. Um, and I thought it'd be funny to show up. Okay, so, uh, 
<laughs> okay, so we looked at um, how you tell a finger tree to add the data, the, 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 the meter data, the measure data to the tree. Here's how you use it. Um, the function we were looking at before was called uh, split at, and it's specifically for these counted things. The more generic one is called split tree. You give it the tree and you give it a predicate, a general predicate that takes as argument, as a single argument, the, the measure, whatever your measure function produced, so in, in our case, the count, and simply returns true or false. And when you tell it to split, it will put everything that um, returned false on the left, and it'll find, actually what it does is it finds a single point, a point in the tree, where your predicate switches from being false to true. So when we're looking things up by index, it's where the, where the count of things on the left matches up with the, what we're looking for. Um, it's possible to create a meter and a tree that has multiple points in it where a particular uh, predicate would switch from false to true. And that's legal, but the finger tree algorithm doesn't uh, make any promises about which transition it's going to find. So I'm not sure how useful that would actually be. OK, so that was one kind of meter. Let's look at a different meter and see if we can figure out why it would be useful. Uh, can you have multiple meters or just one for each tree? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can actually only have one meter, but um, monoids are composable, and so you could actually write a meter, and um, it may still even be in the code. Uh, there's a function that builds a new meter out of other, it's like composing a function, right? Um, you can stack them onto each other and put multiple pieces of information in there. Uh, when I actually did that, I was thinking I was going to have some wonderfully composable um, thing that allow you to uh, create your customized finger trees out of pieces without having to get down and dirty with the actual meter functions. Um, but it turns out you, it's, you can't really describe using closure abstractions what it is you just built. You can do that, but you can't say that it is countable without it being a new specific type. So anyway, all that to say, um, generally, well, well, we'll look. That's a good question, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll see something that's related to that. Okay, so for this one, our measure is the identity function. So the measure of the element A is just A, right, itself. The measure of empty is nil, you can see that here in this empty tree, nil. The combined function is this thing. It's always the second argument, unless that is false, right, or falsing, in which case it's the first argument which is kind of a way of saying the rightmost thing. So you can see that here. Um, we, we have B, C, and D. The measure of that is D. And that bubbles on up. And over here, the rightmost thing is M, and that bubbles up. So that allows us to ask the whole tree, what's your rightmost item? Well, we already could do that. We could look at the tree and get that. So what are we doing here? Anybody have any guesses? It's sorted. Look at all the values. What, what, what? It's sorted. It's sorted. Ah, insertion order, yes. It doesn't tell us a whole lot unless we also promise that we're going to keep things in sorted order. If we promise we're going to keep the entire tree in sorted order, we can now look things up by their value. We can say, does this collection include an F? And we can walk down the tree, finding things that are between, um, you know, find a spot where F belongs. It's more than A, but less than Q, less than M, less than M. Here it is. You can find right where it would belong in the tree. Or if it doesn't exist, you can find the spot where it should be and conclusively say in log and time, this does not exist. So it's a sorted set. Right, good, sorted set. Okay, but it's just a sorted set because you can't let people add things to the ends anymore. So our big finger tree feature is gone and it really is just a sorted set. Of course, we already have a sorted set that believe me, runs a lot faster than this will. So um, what good is it? It's good if you add another piece of data. So if you have a new meter that does both the rightmost item and the count, you can now look things up both by their value in sorted order or by their index. Okay, you can navigate the tree either way depending upon what predicate you pass to your split function. And so you can do things like this with a counted sorted set. You can feed it a bunch of items in whatever order you want, and it will sort them, just like a sorted set. 
You can then call get to find out whether things exist. E is there, so it returns it. E, E is not, so you get nil. Those are log in. You can also do nth. You can find the fifth thing. Now, in a, in a uh, closure persistent sort of set, the only way to get the nth thing is to walk from one side in. Um, and so that's a linear operation. Here it's log n because we sort of built in an index into our tree of how to find things in sorted order. And of course you can do other counted kinds of things on it because we know at the root how big the, the whole tree is. So that's a counted sorted set. Okay. So that's all the um, pre-built finger trees that are included in the library. So I've got a little bit more here where we can look at what it would take to build your own finger tree. Um, <clears throat> the idea here in this example is that this could be a very application specific kind of thing. You could have an application that is dealing with, uh, say, a queue of, of items, each of which have some kind of a cost. You always add things to one side and you pull them off the other. Um, and maybe you have um, some limited resource. I don't know if the cost is maybe how large something is and you have a fixed amount of space. Um, but the idea is you have to take things in order because it's a queue and you want to know uh, where is the, what's the straw that breaks the camel's back? If I have a fixed value of say seven, I have room for seven cost units and I want to know how many things will fit in under that wire and immediately start processing anything beyond that. That's what we're demonstrating here. So first we're gonna build a finger tree and we're gonna tell it what its meter is. Um, we're actually gonna uh, make sure that all of the items in this particular finger tree uh, know their own cost. So we can just, um, that's a simple way to do it. So we're gonna look up the cost of each of the items. And then this is kind of like count, right? The cost of an empty tree is, is none, no cost at all. And we're gonna add up the costs in order to figure out the total cost of a tree or, or subtree. And then we're gonna build one, right? Here's our empty cost tree that we just made, and so we're gonna con a bunch of things onto it. And now we can ask the root, what is your measure? So before we were using count, that was sort of a specific thing. This is the general finger tree function for finding out what is the measure of the whole tree. So we can immediately see that the cost of all of these items added together is 15. And then we can find out what are the items that will fit that, that do not fit in under seven. Okay, so if we add these up manually, we can see that this first one is fine. We add another one in there, six, that's okay. Seven, eight, that's gonna take us over the limit. So starting with that one, that's uh, Mr. J there, that's our first one that doesn't fit. And here's a sequence of all the remaining items. So again, if this were some kind of regular queue where you didn't have this um, cost function on it, the only way to find out would be to actually start from the beginning and walk in counting things up to find out where the transition happens. And this allows you to do it in log in time instead. Um, and so you can see how uh, this essentially pops one item off the left here. The rest, we take the, the, um, the expensive one off the end of the queue. And now when we ask uh, what is not going to fit, it takes us straight to L because uh, one plus two plus three is still uh, seven or less. Okay, um, and I think, all right, yeah, I'm about done, so good. All right, so here's what's in the uh, finger tree library, right? We've got double list, which is um, like a list, but it lets you add on either side, right, left or right. You've got a counted double list, which is like a double list, but you can do nth and count on it fast. We've got a counted sorted set, which is like a sorted set plus n, and the tools you need to build your own finger tree. Now, despite um, Stuart Holloway's best efforts, they're not actually completely done. Uh, there's some things that could be uh, that could be improved. Uh, in particular, they don't uh, handle some of the normal things you'd expect of a closure uh, collection. Uh, there's no support for metadata. I think if you compare a finger tree to anything else, it always says false. It's, they're all different from each other. Um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, was uh, bothered me while I was writing it was having to uh, introduce these new functions, consl and conj r and ft split at, because we have a sequence function split at, right, that isn't 
abstractable at all. Uh, same thing for concat. So um, it would be neat if closure uh, built-in functions were sufficiently abstract so that we could use those um, instead of having to have specialized functions. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of unit tests in there already, but I'm sure there's some uh, cases I haven't covered. Uh, so tests for correctness would be nice. Um, uh, but even more interesting to me would be complexity. Um, it's hard to say whether I understood the paper fully <laughs> or not, and so it'd be nice to demonstrate that all the um, complexity guarantees about log n efficiency and, and amortized constant time um, that are proved in the paper actually hold out in my implementation. Um, and performance, of course, you can always improve that, and primitives. Uh, I don't see any reason that we couldn't do the same thing for finger trees that uh, Rich already did for generic vectors, so they can hold primitive values instead of only objects. And that's all we've got.